to uh, ask Jack Duvall, who is head of ICNC, to introduce our guest speaker. Welcome, Jack. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I'm Jack Duvall, the president of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, and we are delighted to welcome you here, and those of us uh, and others who are watching via live streaming on more than one website, uh, to come to hear the thoughts and the guidance of uh, an individual who tomorrow, here at the Fletcher Summer Institute for the Advanced Study of Nonviolent Conflict, will receive the James Lawson Award for outstanding achievement in the practice of nonviolent action. I first met Kumi Naidu when he was the head of Civicus, an international alliance of civil society organizations. And my organization was uh, one of those members of Civicus, and we were often at exhibits and events uh, of that organization. And um, we were impressed with him then because he had a remarkable ability to organize and represent a very diverse group of people anxious to take action to redress practically every kind of human wrong that you could imagine. Uh, that's really the equivalent of what the leader of a nonviolent movement or campaign does. When we took cognizance of his role at Greenpeace to lead that very important organization, uh, we were delighted to see that because we knew that he had a good understanding of nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience. And if there is any organization in the world that is uh, better known than Greenpeace for nonviolent direct action to address serious abuses in the environment and other serious problems that the world faces, I don't know of one because Greenpeace is at the front lines of this action on a global basis. There haven't been too many global movements that have been formed in the world uh, in the last decade but there will be many in the future. And we'll be talking to someone, we'll be hearing from someone who has experience in that venue, in that global venue right now. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Kumi Naidu. Thank you, Jack, for that kind introduction. And friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear brothers and sisters, it is a real honor for me to be with you here today. I'm hoping the technology is not going to let me down. Coming from Africa, I used to always uh, resist using PowerPoints because sometimes, you know, we never had power. And, and generally, most of the things that I was saying were pointless. So. Uh, so let's hope that it works today. I want to start very quickly by doing an overview of the world that we live in. Today, the world we live in is increasingly characterized by a deepening democratic deficit. Even though just 20 plus years ago, when the Berlin Wall came down, there was a promise of a peace dividend that all the resources that were going to spying and military expenditure and so on, because the Cold War was coming to an end with the fall of the Berlin Wall, we were going to have this dividend of resources going to education, health, uh, housing, and so on. Sadly, the reality is that that promise of a peace dividend never happened. But together with a change of the way we spend our money. The other promise was that there was going to be explosion of democracy. What has happened since 1989, since the fall of the Berlin Wall? Yes, we have more countries today where we have elections, but actually I would argue that we have more elections in the world today, but actually we have less democracy. Why? One of the core notions of democracy was the democracy was to balance the wallet with the ballot, meaning 
the power of the wealthy and powerful people that controlled society during the feudal times was to be balanced with the voice and perspectives of ordinary people. Sadly, if we are brutally honest, if we look at money and politics, we see that in fact in far too many countries today, we have the form of democracy without the substance of democracy. So you could look at the United States today and describe the United States as the best democracy money can buy. When you look at how contaminated US politics is by big money. I'll come back to that in a second. The second problem we have in the world today is that increasingly the big challenges that we face, we cannot solve them at the national level. Whether we're talking about an environmental issue, whether we're talking about climate change, peace, security, and even if you take an issue like HIV AIDS, because the pricing of life-saving pharmaceutical drugs happens at a patenting organization at the global level. So even when you take a local issue like that, if you take an issue of violence against women and children, and you can say, well, that's just a national issue, but if you look at some of the frameworks of socialization and the portrayal of women in popular media, then in fact, you can see that there are certain centers of media production in the world, Hollywood being one of them, which contributes to a particular construction of both masculinity and femininity. So we have this new term where people say, well, global governance institutions. Some of you might have heard this. But I want you to cast your mind back now to the early 1980s. Can any of you remember a slogan that said, think globally, act locally? Please raise your hands. Okay, almost 80% of us. What was behind that slogan was irrespective of the issue that we were trying to address at the national or local level, we needed to better understand our global processes, global power, global institutions, and global discourse and narratives shaped what we could or could not achieve realistically at the national or the local level. However, one of the ironies of the moment of world history that we are living in is that precisely at a time when countries like my own South Africa or the successor states of the former Soviet Union or countries in Latin America that were coming out of military dictatorship and so on were getting formal democracy for the first time, real power was shifting from the national to the global levels. So today, you can have a government in a developing country which is efficient, effective, anti-corrupt, and so on, they will never be able to solve the economic problems because trade rules are written at the World Trade Organization. And if you're a small country, in Africa, for example, what chance you have to actually really shape that agenda is very limited. So when we look at our global governance institutions, who are they are? Who are they? So generally, you know, we're talking about the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, the WTO, and so on. And here's the problem with our global governance institutions. Most of them were set up in 1945 or around that time at the end of the Second World War. And they are stuck in the geopolitics of 1945. So there are five deficits the global governance institutions have, and that is a democratic deficit. So you could say the World Bank and the IMF are governed on a one dollar, one vote system, right? So that the powerful countries have more voice than the, even though most of the decisions made by the World Bank, for example, affects people in poor countries, right? But because the people who put the money into the World Bank are the big developed countries, they really control the agenda of the policies and implementation of programs of the World Bank. But if you look at the United Nations, for example, the United Nations, most civil society activists will say, is a bit more democratic and a bit more benign. But if you ask yourself, why does, the, why does certain countries hold the permanent veto at the Security Council? So you can say, well, China, the US, uh, 
Russia, based on population size, you know, they, they're right up there in the top five. So if you were to say, based on population size, it's okay for them to have a veto. But why should France and England, uh, sorry, Britain, might soon be England after the Scottish referendum. <coughs> uh, why, why, why should they have a veto? Well, in 1945, it made sense. They were colonial hegemons controlling large amounts of people on the planet through, through their colonial empires. But today, given their population size, there is no justification. The only justification is that they are holders of weapons of mass destruction. Right? But if you're going to use that definition, then we need to expand the UN Security Council to include you know, Pakistan, India, North Korea, Israel, and a few others. <laughs> so, so basically, our global governance institutions, which have become more important because they are supposedly the institutions that are going to deliver a trade solution, a peace solution, a climate solution, and so on, are suffering from a democratic deficit, a coherence deficit because there's a multiplicity of structures that have been set up. So your health minister goes to the WHO, your trade minister goes to the WTO, and so on. It's a, co you know, it's a, it's a catastrophe, right? So there's a coherence deficit, a compliance deficit. By compliance, I mean, if you go and look at most of the decisions made at global events, not even 10% is implemented. You know, a lot of hot air and fanfare and so on, but actually the implementation is very limited. The third problem I want to highlight is this issue of deepening social exclusion. Now in most countries, and including in the academic literature, when you talk about social exclusion, it's referring, prim people seem to think it's referring primarily to minorities, right? That is, people of uh, religious, minorities, ethnic, linguistic minorities in some societies, people with uh, alternative sexual orientations, people living with HIV AIDS, indigenous peoples, and so on. But actually, I would want to make the troubling argument this evening that actually the majority of people in the world are actually socially excluded. When you add just three constituencies, young people, women, and older people. In many, many societies, it varies from country to country, but in, in the main, humanity deprives itself of the intelligence, the energy, the creativity, the innovation of the major, majority of women, the majority of young people, and the majority of older people. So what is the democracy that we have then if the majority of people actually do not have a real stake in the main things that are happening in different societies around the world. Then we add to it, in the current context, the so-called war on terror. So I want to share with you a small story. Any of you remember a guy called John Ashcroft? He used to be the Attorney General of the United States under President Bush. And I had occasion to debate him at the World Economic Forum before the start of the Iraq war. And the topic was, how will the war on terror shape the future? And it so happened, I, I was here, he was somewhere there, and there was a the president of Colombia, the president of, uh, uh, prime minister of Malaysia, and the vice president of the RAND Corporation, which is a think tank outside of Washington. And if you're an NGO person on a, on a panel like that at the World Economic Forum, you are lucky in a 90-minute session you get like 10 minutes to speak. But it has one very big advantage because everybody else has said what they want to say so you can respond because usually they also bring you in the end. And it has another advantage because usually you're the only person of color on the platform and the entire audience is like, oh shit, they forgot the black guy, right? Because the moderator is not like coming to you. So like eventually when the moderator comes to you, it's like, Whew. it'll be so embarrassing sitting in the audience and the one person who's got some color on him is left out. <laughs> so it's, it's usually quite good. But in any case, when it, when it came to me, I said, calling our response to 
the tragedy of September 11, 2001, a war on terror, was a strategic, tactical, ethical, as well as a grammatical error. Because, let's be blunt about it, terrorism is a tactic, and if we understand the world history, so many governments have used this tactic repeatedly over and over and over, and do so right now. So, you know, how do you wage a war against a tactic? Right? That's what I mean by grammatically. But the more ethically, what, what was the problem was that calling it a war on terror gave legitimacy to the people that executed the act by calling it a war. What we should have called it was a crime against humanity and a gross violation of human rights and treated it like that. By calling it a war, what we did was we suddenly gave juice and legitimacy and if anything, everything that has been done in the name of the war on terror has actually served to fuel terror sentiment, increase the numbers, create more conflict, destroy more lives and so on, rather than to do the opposite. And just to be clear, when that tragedy happened, Civicus took the lead. I was at the Civicus then, and we brought together a range of civil society organizations to agree a statement. And it was quite an interesting thing. We did it by video conference, uh, sorry, teleconference, but people from many countries around the world, many organizations in the United States and so on. And there was a line there that said, our response to this tragedy will determine what the future will be. And a disproportionate, violent response driven by a sense of revenge will, ex will exacerbate that a bad situation and make it worse. And sadly, we were right and our governments were wrong. But one of the implications of the war on terror has been it's become a war on trade unionists, a war on various activists, and at the global level, it has had the impact of curtailment of international civic mobility. I bet you nobody knows what that jargon means. I also don't know. <laughs> Now, basically, it was a board member of Civicus who liked to come up with big terms, and this is what he did. But essentially, it has become incredibly difficult to hold a global gathering and get the people to that gathering that you really want to because of the restrictions that have been put on people traveling from the Arab world, from South Asia, and so on. And me, even though I don't come from the Middle East, I'm not Muslim and I'm not Arabic, I fit the profile perfectly, so I have a lot of personal experience of what it means to actually, you know. So with going back to John Ashcroft, what essentially I, I said to him was, everything that you'll have done has undermined certain fundamental tenets of democracy. And the test of a strong democracy is not whether you can avoid detaining people without trial, racial and religious profiling, invading people's privacy, when everything is more or less going well in your society. The real test of democracy is whether you can hold true to those values when, in fact, you are under threat. And that was a failure of Western democracies generally, but particularly the United States and, I would say, the United Kingdom in their rush to war uh, without proper reasoning behind it. But the crisis that has now changed everything about the moment that we live in is the climate crisis. And I will talk more about it in a second, but suffice to say that in fact we are pretty much running out of time with regard to where we stand with where our planet is in terms of how little time we have to make the changes that we need to make to ensure that we can secure this planet for future generations. But another big contextual reality of the moment that we live in is the deepening, deepening inequality between the rich and the poor. In virtually every country today, the gap between the rich and poor is growing at an unsustainable rate. And the gap between 
most of the wealthier countries and most of the poorer countries is also growing. Though there are exceptions with the big emerging countries of Brazil and um, China and India and so on, but the vast majority of developing countries are also seeing that they are not developing to cope in terms of uh, dealing with the question of the equality between rich and poor countries. But I just want to ask you to stop a minute and just think about this statistic a bit. 85 of the richest people in the world have as much power and have as, have as much money than half the rest of the people in the world. How did that happen? And, I, and, and uh, okay, this is just one statement of inequality. Yeah? There are many others I can give you. But the good news is, you might think it's good news, is that the World Economic Forum this year in Davos, Switzerland, where the big the gathering of CEOs and uh, political leaders happen, what was the main issue they wanted to address? Deepening inequality. But here's the problem. Many of the issues that people in this room are care about and are talking about, at one level we've won that debate. All these issues, you know, the very fact that the World Economic Forum would, would say we have to address inequality, you could say, in fact, it's an indication that we are beginning to win the argument. But what happens at the World Economic Forum, in terms of how the discussion is phrased, and this is how the powerful respond to all our demands at the moment, it was not about system innovation, system transformation, and system redesign. It was about system maintenance, system protection, and system recovery, right? And the bottom line that we must ask ourselves, and I want to be critical here, because we, and maybe the bigger organizations more so than the smaller ones, we also have to begin to question whether in fact we have been so incorporated into the whole system of governance, even when we are supposedly on the other side, that in fact we are not willing sufficiently to challenge the power structures because it will impact on us as well. I'll leave that troubling thought for the question and answer session. So when you look at the United States, for example, uh, for every member of Congress, the oil, coal, and gas industry comes up with enough money to employ a minimum of three full-time lobbyists to a maximum of eight full-time lobby uh, lobbyists for every single member of Congress. So those of you who are not in the United States, you should not be surprised why it's been so difficult to get progressive climate legislation through the US Congress. Because, in fact, the dominance of particularly polluting industries, as well as the military industry, in um, the governance in the United States has become disproportionately too powerful. And, in, and importantly, I believe it was President Eisenhower who warned us decades ago, be careful of the military-industrial complex which will undermine and eat our democracy. And I want to suggest that that warning was not adhered to, and you are seeing that happening in the United States right now. Some of you might think, why am I focused so much on the United States? Well, one, we are in the United States. Two, what happens in the United States, sadly, has a disproportionate ripple effect in all our countries. Right? What is talked about as a norm here becomes a norm elsewhere, and sometimes our political leaders in developing countries, because of an aid package that they're receiving from some developed country, will do the bidding even in terms of pushing the narrative and the discourse of the country giving the aid, for example. Just a few weeks ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, probably the biggest scientific effort of humanity as seen, came up with the report that basically says that we are fast running out of time to act to prevent catastrophic climate change. They said that known oil, coal, and gas reserves, as much as 80% of known oil, coal, and gas reserves need to stay underneath the ground if, in fact, 
we are to stand a chance of averting catastrophic climate change. They point out, for example, that in March of last year, the concentration of carbon surpassed the 400 parts per million. Now, that's a bit of a jargon, but let me just tell you that 400 parts per million, the last time the planet added that much of carbon, the Arctic was completely ice-free, Africa was covered with savanna forests, and our oceans were about 20 to 15, 15 to 20 meters higher than they are now. The Arctic sea ice reached its minimum level in 2012. Now, you might be thinking the Arctic is so far away up there, what has it got to do with us? The Arctic sea ice plays a critical role in the management of our climate. It serves as a reflector of the sun's rays back into the atmosphere. And if in the summer months, as we had last year, Arctic sea ice levels drop so low, then the extreme weather event that folks had on the East Coast here in December, January, and thankfully for the first time I saw some intelligence by some American journalists who were calling it the polar vertex and the Arctic freeze because they understood what was happening in New York was connected to what was happening up in the uh, North Pole. So bottom line is, uh, we went to Copenhagen. I'm a f how many of you remember the Copenhagen Climate Summit? Now that summit was supposed to be the place where we would agree what was called a fab deal. Not a fabulous deal, but a fair, ambitious, and binding climate treaty. What we got was a flab outcome, F-L-A-B, full of loopholes and bull, right? And in fact, the science was telling us then that we needed to get the deal in 2009 that carbon emissions must peak by 2015 and start coming down. Our politicians failed to get the deal, and simply they then said, well, okay, we'll get the deal in 2015 in Paris, and then we'll only start implementing it in 2020. That's the trajectory we are now. And they completely ignored what the science is saying, but importantly, not only what the science is saying, but also what Mother Nature itself is saying, because in the last 10 years, we have seen 100% increase in extreme weather events. If each of you think about your countries and what's happening, I'm sure you will find one or more weird things happening that suggest that climate change is not simply something that's gonna hit us in the future, but is already hitting us now. So the bottom line is, most of our world leaders are suffering from a classic case of cognitive dissonance, meaning that all the facts are increasingly there, but they are in denial. And I must respectfully say, though, that this problem of cognitive dis uh, dissonance and denial is just as much afflicting many of us in the progressive community as well. And I want to make a confession to you this evening that it took my daughter to educate me about the fact that we were running out of time on climate. I came from a background of uh, democracy, uh, anti-poverty, human rights, and gender equality activism. And in fact, growing up in South Africa, sadly, you know, I grew up thinking, you know, environmentalism is what rich and white people did, right? And sadly, that has been a image of environmentalism that we have to change. Because environmentalism is fun, environmental justice is fundamentally necessary for our existence on this planet and so it impacts on social justice and everything else. So I'm now moving to the arguments on civil disobedience. Oops. Oops. Sorry. Told you I'm not good at these things. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is the word maladjusted. It is the ringing cry of modern child psychology, maladjusted. Now, of course, we all want to live the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But as I move toward my conclusion, I would like to say to you today, in a very honest manner, that there are some things in our society and some things in our world for which I'm proud to be maladjusted. 
And I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of God's children smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. The last thing that Martin Luther King says he doesn't want to be adjusted to is something that I want to suggest that we have all become very adjusted to that we have come to accept as normal that certain people can live such massively affluent lives, which actually quite often they're very sad by, by the way, um, and that we can walk past people living in extreme poverty uh, on, on a regular basis. And if you look at it on a global basis, let me give you a, a troubling quotation from Richard Curtis, the director and producer of Four Weddings and a Funeral. You remember that movie? Notting Hill as well. <laughs> you know, it was the same Richard Curtis, but he worked with us around the Make Poverty History campaign, you know, the One campaign uh, on debt cancellation and so on. And he said something that I couldn't say and get away with it, but he stood up in a meeting in London and he said, if 7,000 people were dying every single day in Western Europe and North America from malaria, as is the case in Africa, if, if 5,000 people were dying every single day in Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, and if 3,000 people were dying every single day from tuberculosis, as is the case in Africa, in Canada and the rest of the OECD countries, you can bet your last cent that those that have real power in the world, said Richard Curtis, they would have found the resources to fix the problem. So I want to say to you that the main problem we face today is that we have adjusted to a type of consumption that does not make us happy, that actually breeds conflict, and that is completely unsustainable. Here's the bottom line. If everybody in the world on average, as to have the average sort of consumption patterns that folks in the developed countries take for granted and the elites in the developing countries take for granted. And by the way, I should tell you, the consumption levels of the elites in the developing countries will put the consumption levels of your elites here in the United States to shame. Right? You can see some serious obscenities in terms of consumptions. Right? I know you all do pretty well in obscenity and consumption here in the United States, but I can tell you some of the folks in the developing countries will give you a good run for your money. But bottom line is, if we were to deliver that to everybody on the planet, according to our friends in WWF, we would need a minimum of three and probably as much as eight planets to deliver that to everybody. Right now, if you look at how much we are taking from the planet, and what the planet has to give, we are living as if we have one and a half planets. We are already extending beyond. And at the core of it is, in fact, what we have come to understand as acceptable. And we accept inequality, overconsumption, stupid consumption, and so on. And I say consciously stupid consumption. There are a lot of things that are produced that humanity just doesn't need, but they've been able to market it and sell it to us that has manufactured that need. And any of you have interest in understanding more of this, I urge you to read a book by Benjamin Barber called Consumed, and the subtitle, title, How the Marketing Industry Infantilizes the Old and Corrupts the Young. The old generally, you know, anti-aging creams and all of that. And the young is mainly creating the market, so the ad advertising industry is already marketing to young people before they have purchasing power, right? Where they're putting billions of dollars to create and manufacture the need for consumption. 
So on the same lines, Cornell West puts it this way. If your success is defined as being well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference, then we don't want successful leaders. We want great leaders who love the people enough and respect the people enough to be unbought, unbound, unafraid, and unintimidated to tell the truth. There was a French sociologist in the 70s called Louis Althusser who made a distinction between what he called the repressive state apparatus and the ideological state apparatus. Let me just check, any of you ever heard of Louis Althusser? I knew Howard Barrel would. <laughs> okay, a few of you. He was a bit of a crazy guy, but a very thoughtful guy. And essentially what he said is the big mistake we mostly make is thinking that our governments control us primarily using the repressive state apparatus, by which he means army, police, formal use of laws, and so on. And he said, actually, the bigger sense of control is the ideological state apparatus. The media environment, the framework for religion, the framework for schooling, uh, social norms and customs, and so on. So, like in the United States, for example, the US regime does not need to deploy its repressive state apparatus because its ideological state apparatus is, is so powerful. So did, did that resonate at all? And, and, and just for, 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 I just want to do a little experiment that I like to do with international audiences. And, and also, the, the being people in the US here, I think it makes it good. So, how many of you have seen at any point CNN International? International. Please raise your hands. Okay, keep your hands up. And our American colleagues, if you traveled abroad and saw it, you know, once even, just, just keep your hands up. Okay, keep your hands up. Now, my second question is, how many of you think CNN International is a left-wing, radical, or liberal news source? Keep your hands up. Okay, nobody. Okay. So my question was, did you think the CNN International is a left-wing or a liberal or progressive news source? Nobody. Now, this is something for my folks. You think so? Okay. A little bit. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but, but we're coming to that. But here's the thing. American citizens do not see CNN International. They see a watered-down right-wing version of that called CNN Headline News, right? But however, when you put it in the continuum within the U.S. political reality, right, you got Fox on the far right, maybe MSNBC sort of on the far left, and CNN right up there. Now, I'm, I'm particularly addressing my colleagues outside of the United States now. Try to understand that. Because whenever I encounter anti-Americanism in Europe, for example, where people are getting fed up about the policies coming up, I say, understand that, in fact, the majority of the American people actually do not know what is happening in their own society and in their own country. Not dissimilar, by the way, to the majority of white South Africans during the apartheid regime that really didn't get it because the information was so managed. Because it's ridiculous, 10 years after 9-11, still opinion polls in the United States were showing that a majority of people in the United States actually thought that Saddam Hussein was responsible for 9-11, right? More than 10 years afterwards, maybe, you know, in the first, and you know, it's not as if our American brothers and sisters have a monopoly on, you know, stupidity or ignorance. It is about what is put before them. So, we need to, in thinking through how do we resist the injustices that we face, have to understand how power is actually concentrated and how power is actually uh, manufactured. Oops. I think I pressed the wrong button. Okay. So, this, uh, just to lighten things up, I thought we'll bring in Matt Damon. Um, but he's going to read from a very important piece by a labor historian in the United States called Howard Zinn. And what, and, and this is, sorry, I, I've kind of delayed it. and I'm only entering the civil disobedience part. I'll speed it up now. 
sorry. Oh, there we go. The topic is civil disobedience. You're saying our problem is civil disobedience. That is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. Our problem is the numbers of people all over the world who have obeyed the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war. And millions have been killed because of this obedience. We recognize this for Nazi Germany. We know that the problem there was obedience, that the people obeyed Hitler. People obeyed. That was wrong. They should have challenged, and they should have resisted. <laughs> but now we have Western civilization, the rule of law. The rule of law has regularized and maximized the injustice that existed before the rule of law. That is what the rule of law has done. When in all the nations of the world, the rule of law is the darling of the leaders and the plague of the people, we ought to begin to recognize this. We have to transcend these national boundaries in our thinking. Nixon and Brezhnev have much more in common with one another than we have with Nixon. J. Edgar Hoover has far more in common with the head of the Soviet secret police than he has with us. It's the international dedication to law and order that binds the leaders of all countries in a comradely bond. That's why we're always so surprised when they get together. They smile, they shake hands, they smoke cigars. They really like one another, no matter what they say. <laughs> we're going to need to go outside the law to stop obeying the laws that demand killing or that allocate wealth the way it's been done or that put people in jail for petty technical offenses and keep other people out of jail for enormous crimes. So the, the rule of law, we mostly accept as a good thing. How many of you here would say that you thought the rule of law was a bad thing? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, clearly every audience has their vanguard participants, okay? Uh, even myself, generally until recently, I have like really not thought deeply about you know, what exactly does the rule of law mean in practical terms for activism because, for example, in South Africa, because we have quite a good constitution, we were able to use the constitution against our government when our government, for example, was not willing to address HIV AIDS and was not willing to provide life-saving pharmaceutical drugs at an you know, affordable price for all sorts of weird reasons. And we were able to take on both our government as well as the big pharmaceutical com companies in our constitutional court and win and, and make progress. So there are examples where, of course, you can use courts and you can use the rule of law to positive effects. So, however, I am increasingly embracing the view that in fact, to a large extent, that the courts have actually served the powerful and have less served the poor. And sometimes even though when the law says that the courts should serve the poor or serve the underdogs, the underdogs or the poor don't have the means, the resources and so on to navigate the legal systems because they're so expensive and, and, and opaque and difficult to penetrate. So, if we accept that the problem we have today in the world, if you take the first part of my presentation, which is deepening injustice, deepening conflict, deepening uh, environmental crisis, and then you look at our response, I would say we have to agree that our, our response has actually been far too timid. Uh, but, the, but the problem is, if we look at the forces that we are against, whether you look at trade justice, environmental justice, look at struggles from Bahrain to uh, Ukraine or Syria or wherever, it's very much a David and Goliath situation where those with power are so overwhelmingly powerful that we who are resisting 
have to become creative about how we marshal our power and deploy it because when I was growing up, as you can see, I'm a tall person. Uh, I remember at primary school, there was a line which said, the taller you are, the harder you fall, right? And so the question is, how do we marshal our efforts to be able to make the changes? Now, I, I, the, the one important point to make is that the struggle for justice has never been a popularity contest, whether it was for civil rights, against slavery, and so on. And up here is Martin Luther King, 41 times arrested, about 41 times in prison, in and out. Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison. I should confess that that photograph is a cheat. That photograph is a cheat. Does anybody know why that photograph is a cheat? Because it was after his release he went there. That's Rosa Parks and Mahatma Gandhi in prison. So, so when they were standing up, when they were standing up for those movements, which today we celebrate as people who had courage, vision, uh, and so on, they were all vilified. They were vilified, they were thought they were crazy, they were stupid, they were radical, they were militants, etc., etc. This is how humanity remembers them, right? Martin Luther King, as a memorial in Washington, D.C., as impressive as any president has had. Rosa Parks as a um, memorial in Montgomery. Nelson Mandela, even when he was alive, he was the only person in the world, living or dead at that time, that every nation in the world decided that his birthday could be declared a day of social action and a day of peace. That's a man who spent 27 years in prison, right? And of course, that's Mahatma Gandhi, who today you go around the world, you see his influence and his message as a very powerful one beyond simply talking about political struggles, but every other struggle. And this year, does anybody recognize this gentleman? <laughs> so we searched for this, and I was very happy to find this. My God, <laughs> you were one handsome bloke, weren't you? <laughs> and Wangari Matai the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize and one of the leading environmentalists was thrown repeatedly in prison before she would eventually receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, th Nobel Peace Prize. So the point I want to make to you is essentially you don't have to worry about saving the planet, as we environmentalists often say. Why? Because the planet can take care of itself. Because if we warm up this planet to a point that humanity cannot exist on, on it, the planet will still be here. It will be bruised, battered, and scarred by humanity's crimes on it. But if we warm it up to a point that we cannot live here and as a species we are extinct, the forests will grow back, the oceans will replenish, and so on. So any of you worried about the planet, don't worry. <laughs> because what is this struggle about? This struggle is about humanity's ability to coexist in a mutually interdependent way with nature for centuries and centuries to come. Put differently, this struggle is fundamentally about securing our children and grandchildren's futures. And there can be no struggle, I would argue, that is more important than that and also is more persuasive to get ordinary people off their butts to get involved in the struggle. Because there's one thing that cuts across all cultures, all continents, and so on, which is a basic responsibility that those of us that bring children in the world should have for them. So, and, and, and the absence of a sense of intergenerational justice and solidarity is shocking. And therefore, today, everywhere in the world I go, from the United States to China, I meet young people who are feeling a desperate sense of betrayal by the adult political and business and social leadership. Uh, and, and unless we are brutally honest, 
about the fact that we in the adult generation say, or pretending to be adults, we have run out of fresh ideas. We need to create the space and so on now for young people's ideas to infuse our thinking about what the future is going to be. Let me give you an example. Do you know in the United States there's a little company called Solar Roadways? Anybody heard of them? Right? A couple of people. That company has come up with a plan and a technology that using the parking lots in the United States and the roads of the United States, we can generate three times more the electricity than we need in the United States. Our deserts collectively in the world, if we did concentrated solar power uh, installations, could generate six times amount of electricity that we need for the entire world. Right? So let's be very clear. Are the solutions there for us to get off dirty brown fossil fuel energy and move to clean, green, renewable energy? Absolutely. But the people that are making huge amounts of profits from the current system are fighting tooth and nail to keep it. And often you'll get comparisons about price. Oh, solar is so expensive, wind is so expensive. You know what they don't tell you? That for decades and decades and decades and even now, every year, more than $1.3 trillion of taxpayer subsidies goes towards supporting oil, coal, and gas globally. So you're not even talking about a level playing field. Solar, wind, and other renewable technologies have come up against this absolute wall of privilege that the fossil fuel companies have hitherto enjoyed. So when you're faced with that, you have to begin to start going to basic principles and saying the world that we live does not need incremental tinkering. It needs fundamental transformation. And yeah, I thought, why don't you use Thomas Jefferson to make the argument? Jefferson once said, I'm frequently, I am certainly not an advocate for frequent changes in laws and constitutions, but laws and constitutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths disclosed, and manners and opinions change with the change of circumstances, institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. My dear brothers and sisters, I put to you that the world we live in today, we have institutions that don't really work for the majority. We have an economic system not only does not work for the majority, but actively works in favor of a minority. That we have an approach to the environment that is taking our planet on a suicidal path, and that climate change today is fundamentally a game changer. The next sentence I'm about to start might surprise some of you. I strongly support the CIA and the Pentagon. When in 2003, they told President Bush in a report that they had commissioned that in the coming decades, the biggest threat to peace, security, and stability will not come from terrorism and will not come from conventional threats, but will come from the impacts of climate change. And in my continent, Africa, we are seeing it. We're seeing it vividly. How many of you know of the genocide in Darfur? Please raise your hands. Okay, in Sudan, right? So fair enough. History will record that that genocide was the first major resource war to be brought about as a result of climate impacts. Lake Chad, one of the largest inland seas in the world, has shrunk, according to the Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, to the size of a pond. And then the Sahel Desert, that runs sort of from Senegal to Sudan, is marching southwards at the rate of almost a mile a year. So land scarcity, water scarcity, together combined give you the toxic mix of food scarcity and together was the catalyst that created the possibility of, of course, manipulative politicians and, you know, manipulating identity and so on. So the situation we find ourselves in is that we must question ourselves now 
about whether in fact it's good enough for us to continue with the kinds of strategies that we've been using to push for change, particularly around climate, because with climate, the science says if we hit a certain level and we are fast getting to it, there's going to be something called catastrophic runaway climate change. They don't tell you exactly what that is, right? No, th there's no clear definition of what that is, but, but they know that once it reaches this point of no return, we will not be able to provide the security and solutions. I mean, rich countries like the United States will be able to adapt and build big walls around Manhattan and so on. Poor countries like Bangladesh, where we're already seeing sea level rise, we are seeing people migrating in large numbers, people's homes being destroyed, sea level rise as impacted on the ground water table so you can't even do agriculture on the coastal regions and so on. So my dear brothers and sisters, if ever there was a time for massive civil disobedience, now is that time. And we rather do it now because there won't be anybody else left in decades to come if we don't uh, act. So then very quickly to remind ourselves, civil disobedience in one of its uh, uh, usages by John Rawls in 71, is a public, nonviolent, and conscientious breach of the law undertaken with the aim of bringing about a change in laws or government policies. But then we look at a continuum. A lot of things that most NGOs do is not actually civil disobedience and doesn't mean that it's bad. It's usually in the space of legal protests, including where we apply for permission, like say when the Democratic or Republic conventions take place, you can apply for permission, you get a permission, and then like when it happened in Boston, the Democratic Par Party convention, anybody went there when it happened? There were some cages put where you could go and demonstrate in those cages, basically. Right? So, oh well, I'm, I'm exaggerating by saying cages, but it was very designated places, right? So, we still should use those spaces. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but we need to go beyond that to nonviolent direct action because all our political business leaders, friends, are suffering from the same medical condition. And this, th they all have the same medical condition and you should have sympathy to them. And that is they're all having a real trouble with their hearing. And therefore, to get through that deafness, we have to raise the volume of what we do to a point where it's irresistible and it is unmistakable that they got to change and they have to change fast. Let's understand that also to the left of that is, and here I'm talking about very specifically nonviolent direct action, and just to note that of course you can have protests that go beyond nonviolence, and as somebody who lived through the struggle of dealing with do we have an armed struggle, do we not have an armed struggle, and so on during the struggle against apartheid, I want to say very clearly, on the one hand, you can have a position that says, for example, in international law, people living under occupation have the right to self-defense. And you can acknowledge that right and respect that right and say people have that right, which I do. As I would have said, we in the anti-apartheid struggle, when we were faced by a regime that only understood the language of violence, it was absolutely, necessary, absolutely clear that people had the right but having the right politically to do something does not mean, doesn't make it necessarily strategically right, tactically right, or even fundamentally in the long term, morally right. So when I look at my, South, my society today, South Africa, and look at the scars that we are carrying in terms of the normalcy that has been given to violence, partly as a result of regime violence that was very, very systematic and was dominant, but I would say, and I'd like your comment in the question time, Howard, on this, I think we, in our resistance, and what some of the things we did in the resistance period, also must take some responsibility, right? Especially things like uh, how collaborators were dealt with. Um, yeah, I'd rather not go into that uh, now, but so my view today might shock some of you, while I respect the right of people under certain circumstances to defend themselves, I would urge people to recognize that 
when we actually go beyond peaceful protests, that the message of why we were there, what we were doing, and so on, gets lost. And let me tell you something. I can prove, not me personally, but studies can show you that when protests have happened and they've become violent, often, not always, but often, more often than not, that the instigators of that violence were agents of the state. Let me give you an example. You can look at, look at this on YouTube. There was a meeting of, called the Three Amigos meeting that was between President Bush, uh, President Fox from uh, Mexico, and Stephen Harper. It was in Quebec, right? And it's all on the internet. What you see is a peaceful demonstration, and then suddenly some militant guy emerges in the middle of it with a stone and a balaclava and so on, and he's saying, come on, let's throw stones, let's shake this thing up, and the trade union guy that was keeping the peace said, listen, this is a peaceful march, please, no violence, and so on. Then, while they're doing that, somebody saw his boots, and they said, Hey, that's a Royal Canadian Mounted Police Boots. This guy is an agent. He's an agent provocateur. The moment he was discovered, he ran towards the cops. They opened a path for him. They absorbed him, and he disappeared. And they denied it for three days that he was, in fact, an agent. And then after that, the evidence was so clear, they had to say, yes, he was a police officer, and yes, he did it. So I want to suggest very strongly, especially to the young people of the world, I understand your pain your anger and your frustration and your sense that you're being betrayed by the current adult leadership in government and business. Totally, you are justified to feel that. But if you are wanting to serve your interests and the interests of future generations as well as current generations, you've got to harness that anger, harness that frustration, and channel it in peaceful, creative, innovative, and types of resistance perhaps the planet has not seen. But violence begets violence, and the reality is that when we accept violence as a norm and we accept violence is okay, we kill part of our own spirit and we kill humanity. And one, what I see in my country right now is an acceptance of violence as if it's a norm. And yeah, I'm talking about criminal violence, all sorts of violence. And when I look at it on a global basis as well, we accept it as a norm. And what we need to do, and we need young people of the world to transform the idea that violence is acceptable and should be treated as a norm. So, as we know, the features of civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action include conscientiousness, that is, people who do it take it seriously. They're not going to have a walk in the park. They, you know, they, they're going to put their lives on the line. They're willing to get arrested. They're willing to be ridiculed. In fact, most often, it's about the willingness to be ridiculed is the first thing you have to accept, where people will think, what a bunch of idiots. Don't forget, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Mandela, and all were also thought as a total bunch of idiots. Just because people around us now cannot see the wisdom of what we're saying does not make it wrong. It makes us, it challenges us to be much more creative in our activism. Uh, and of course, being, one problem you have with civil society activism quite often is that we do some good actions but nobody finds out about it. And we've got to get better at ensuring that when we do something that there is a plan to get it out. And that's one of the things that our brothers and sisters in the Arab world taught us. And by the way, isn't it interesting if we think about the best forms of civil disobedience and courageous civil disobedience. We saw it in a place in the world where many people would have thought, oh, we need to go and teach those people how to do civil disobedience. Seriously? And, and by the way, be careful not to call it the Arab Spring. Because I called it the Arab Spring, and one of my colleagues at Greenpeace was from Lebanon said, Kumi, you too. I said, what? What do you mean? He said, no, how can you call it the Arab Spring? That is suggesting that the struggle for justice is a seasonal activity. <laughs> <laughs> and of course... It was not that it just happened. People had been working there for a long time. But, and, 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 and how did people say it? In, in Egypt, for example, they said, we use Facebook to organize the event, Twitter to tell people where to go, when to go, and then we use YouTube 
to report back what we did, right? And what we are seeing, I don't want to overstate the power of social media because the power of social media still does not balance the power of the dominant broadcast media, but it is playing a role of giving us voice and we can do much more to, to escalate and get that under control. So I've, I've already spoken to the issue of violence, but I just want to say, w when is civil disobedience completely justified? When in response to an instance of substantial and clear injustice, when alternative ways to achieve the objective have been exhausted, when done in coordination with other groups, and when humanity's survival is under threat. Now that sounds as if it was written for climate change, but it, sh it was, by the way, but, but <laughs> But you could have said when a community's survival is under threat. You know, if you look at a community living in the Brazilian Amazon, you know, who are being impacted by an industrial project, for example. So let's be clear, there are lots of objections to civil disobedience. Some people say civil disobedience undermines democracy, uh, doesn't uh, allow people to engage in dialogue, and so on. And Martin Luther King's was uh, in his letter from a Birmingham jail uh, to um, white religious leaders, Christian leaders, one of the, th because they, he was being criticized, and <laughs> I feel funny having you in the audience and me telling this story. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, the, the, the religious, mainstream religious leadership was saying, but why aren't you engaged in dialogue? We want to talk. You mustn't do these naughty things in the street and so on. And he said, the very purpose of nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience is to foster dialogue. We have tried to have dialogue for so long and you're not prepared to have meaningful dialogue and unless we engage in civil disobedience, you are not going to take us seriously and we want to have a dialogue that's based on some equalization of power. And if you cannot show constituency, if you cannot show support, those in power will never take you seriously. So I thought I'll just do a quick overview of some of the, I'm not gonna stay too long with it, this actually was a demonstration that took place in Turkey in the middle of the Gezi Park protests last year. And there was a rumor that Mandela had died that day in the morning. He hadn't. Uh, but quickly, a banner was made and so on, and 5,000 people marched through the streets of Istanbul to g together with the Gezi Park protests. Uh, I thought I should make the point though that where we are right now is going to call for sacrifice. I think we must be, I can only be honest and blunt about it. That in fact, if we think that we are going to address the huge injustices and challenges that we have in a context that we are running out of time, then we are kidding ourselves. And these, this is a quotation from Mandela just as he went to court when he said, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. And these are the important words. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. And I think that's a very good attitude to have. None of us want to die, right? Uh, none of us want to give up our lives. We all have people in our lives that we love and care about and so on. But I think the spirit should be that in fact what is at stake here is so big that we are prepared to make sacrifices and, and, and that in fact civil disobedience cannot be completely sanitized. And that's the point I'm making. If we want to say civil disobedience can be something where you can participate in a demonstration in the morning, get arrested in the morning, get released in the afternoon and be home in time for tea, that might not always work out like that, right? It does happen like that. I've had, it, I've had experiences like that. Uh, but increasingly, that's more the exception to how the police authorities behave than the rule. So I thought to bring the point home, and I, and I will tell you right now what you must look for in this clip. Look for the last expression on this journalist's face. Oh dear.
What do you tell people who are scared to protest because they're worried that they'll get arrested, beaten, or just simply surveilled in the massive surveillance grid that exists today? Well, one, I was blessed to go to jail because I was willing to bear witness and deal with the consequences. I would do it again, but there's no doubt there's an increasing repression. There's an attempt to create a culture, not just of silence, but a culture of fear, especially for the younger generation, to intimidate them, to make sure they're so afraid that they're not willing to step out, bear witness in public, and have to deal with the consequences of, of civil disobedience. We just simply have to have more courage that we're, we're dealing now with a much more autocratic and authoritarian state and you have to be more courageous. You have to be more courageous to tell you the truth. You have to be more willing to deal with the cost. And in the end, uh, some of us simply have to die, that's all. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the chilling effect is what they're counting on. I love, this, I love this woman's reaction to that last comment. I wouldn't have known how to uh, react to it. So, obviously, you know, I've made a, I've thought deeply about whether to bring this element into this, and, and I, I do it quite consciously to say that I believe that leadership must be about telling the truth. It must be about telling people the uncomfortable truth, and in a time when those with power are increasingly resistant to change and are using more and more repressive and more creative ways to restrict the possibilities of resistance, sadly, it is going to call upon all of us to show much greater leadership than we've been willing to do before. And the good news is, all around the world, people are doing it. This is a protest from the UK around fracking. Uh, and, and by the way, very inspired by the protests in the United States around fracking. The big protests that started in various parts of the US has inspired folks in, on the other side of the pond, as they say. This is a protest in uh, India, and the result of this protest is that Greenpeace India is facing a 66 million euro law case being brought by this company against us for trying to stop it from starting a coal project in, and destroying a very important forest in India. And in addition to that, the CIA equivalent of in India just three weeks ago released a report saying that Greenpeace is, maybe you have the better words. Greenpeace is responsible for bringing down the GDP of India by 2.5%. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so Greenpeace is responsible for bringing the GDP down by 2.5%. Let me just be very clear, not just Greenpeace, but all the environmental organizations, or the serious ones anyway, are not anti-developmental. We want a development that is sustainable. We want the 1.6 billion people in the world who do not have access to a single light bulb to have access to energy. What we are saying is, you don't have to build a big coal power plant or a nuclear plant to get it. In fact, if we're seriously concerned about that 1,6 billion people in the world who have no access to any electricity, the way to do it is not by big energy projects, because these are smaller communities in size, living in rural areas and sparsely populated. The way to do it quickly, fastly, cheaply, and sustainably is through decentralized renewable energy. And in the state of Bihar, for example, in India, which has one of the lowest levels in India of uh, electricity access, we managed to convince all the political players there to go for a decentralized uh, solar grid and are working quite successfully in doing it, taking a lot of people out of energy poverty. And this year was the action that happened in Russia last year. Since it was in the news, oh, maybe, oh, sorry, I thought it was a video. <laughs> okay, so this one, is a video. Let me, let me just tell you a little bit about this. In 2012, I had the honor of participating in a similar demonstration. And at that time, this is about far north in the planet you can go. And the only reason Gazprom, this Russian company, state-owned company, can drill and explore there is because we have burned so much oil, coal, and gas already that in the summer months, the ice is melting. Right? So now, 
rather than see the melting of the sea ice as a threat that should urge us to move our fossil fuels, in our wisdom, many of our governments, from the Obama administration to the Putin administration, they are looking at, ha, ah, let's go and see whether there's oil and gas in the Arctic. Right? And this part of the world is very unique in terms of biodiversity, but it's also critically important for the global climate regulation system. And for that reason, uh, we have prioritized Sorry. We have prioritized defending the Arctic. And so last year, when we went in 2012, the Russian Coast Guard was there. They saw us engaging in peaceful protests, and they didn't uh, intervene. We were there for almost a week. And in fact, you know, when our ship was moving after the protest, they contacted us. Where are you going? We said, we're leaving to do a research expedition. They said they wished us a happy safe journey and we left. And in fact, they liked us more than they liked the Gazprom people because the Gazprom people were abusing them and swearing at them and all, and, and we were very honest. And that's one of the things about civil disobedience. You can be clandestine maybe in the way you plan and so on. You don't want to tell everybody that you're going to be doing a demonstration at this place in that time and, and, and so on because the, you know, there'll be more police waiting there for you before you can even get there. But once you're there and you've done it and so on, you've got to be transparent of why it was done, how it was done, and not lie about it. Because we have to act with moral courage and with the sense of higher sense of morality than those in, in government. So, so this was what happened when my colleagues went last year. And, and can I just check, did most of you hear about the people that were in prison in Russia last year, the Arctic 30? Okay, so this is what happened when they got there. Probably a bit hard to follow. So let me just say that that boat there, that's the Russian Coast Guard ship. Uh, these are Greenpeace uh, inflatable boats. And the woman up uh, who was hanging up there, her name is Sini Sarela. She was with me actually the year before, also participated in the action. And that time we managed to get up the rig and occupy it for about 25, uh, sorry, 15 hours. And she was saying, I'm coming down, I'm coming down. And, and you know, I can tell you, to be up there, there's like a monstrosity of concrete at the bottom, right? If you fall, you're a goner, right? And so, anyway, what transpired for the Arctic 30 is that they ended up 100 plus days in terrible prison conditions in an Arctic prison called Murmansk. Then they were transferred to St. Petersburg, and then they were, we finally managed to get them out on bail after about 100 days. And then they couldn't leave the Russia. They had to wait for the court case. And then eventually, with all the pressure and so on, when an amnesty was being declared for Pussy Riot and some other people in prison already, thankfully, the Greenpeace people were also included in the amnesty. But they held on to our ship. And our ship, only two weeks ago, they finally agreed that we can get it back. But when you keep a ship for nine months in a dock, it's pretty dead. So we have to spend our resources trying to um, rehabilitate it. Uh, so to conclude, where are we now? And what do we need to do? These are my concluding suggestions to you. First. We have to stop playing by the rules imposed by the status quo. Second, we have to find a powerful antidote to apathy, and we have to act with moral courage. Three, we need to make a distinction 
between access to power versus influence over power. Meaning, many NGO activists spend a lot of time talking to people in government and business under the illusion that we're having real influence, when in fact, it's simply having access. They are ticking off a box somewhere that says, civil society consulted, right? And we are under the illusion that, oh, wow, we have really had an influence. I'm not saying that dialogue does not have influence, but I think we need to become more critical about whether, in fact, everything we do uh, does really have influence. What is at stake is too important for us to continue with the dithering and lack of political will by the political and business class. We need to recognize also that nature does not negotiate. And while addressing the shifting uh, nature of power, we also need to be addressing the shifting power of nature. We need to go beyond system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. And what we need is system redesign, system innovation, and system transformation. But the most important thing in terms of civil disobedience is you've got to start where people are. And you've got to recognize activism is a journey. That we should never expect that everybody is going to go and climb an oil rig or do something where they're going to necessarily get arrested. But when we were up there on the rig, for example, we knew we were okay because there were people who were lawyers. There were people who were good administrators. There were people who were good logistics people. There were people who could do good transportation. There were medics uh, and so on. So my bottom line is that there are multiple roles that people can play to be part of civil disobedience. It doesn't ma mean that everybody who steps into that police van or steps into that, you know, has to have the, uh, that everybody has to do that. In fact, if everybody steps into the police van and there's no media people left outside to tell the rest of the world that in fact that's happened, then you've actually blown that civil disobedience action, right? So while I rec and I, but it's really important that we create a context for people to contribute according to their ability, according to their circumstances, according to the life realities, and so on, right? It's not about taking away from what I said earlier about courage and so on, because part of courage is also knowing what is possible and working with what is possible and trying, because if we take an approach that, my God, the world is so messed up, we have to get everybody to do everything possible tomorrow and, and let's just mobilize people. You freak people out and you're not going to be able to get people to go in a journey with you. And I have to say it's a difficult thing to do because when I was speaking to an audience in the U.S. a couple of years ago, saying our, our oceans, we have four decades to turn things around, if otherwise our oceans are going to be dead and climate and so on. And a woman put up her hand at the end and said, Dr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? I said, yes. And then she said, do you know what his most famous speech was called? And I thought it was a trick question, so I was, I was a bit tentative. I said, I, I have a dream? And then she said, yes! It was, I have a dream, but when I hear you speak, it sounds like you have a nightmare. <laughs> How are you going to inspire people to stand up and fight? And so the challenge we have right now is we got to speak truth to power. We got to speak the truth. We cannot, we cannot downplay how serious things are, whether it's on inequality, whether it's on economic uh, disenfranchisement, whether it's on the, the, the theft of our democracy, uh, democracies by a handful of people, and whether it's about our children's future going down the tube. We got to speak about it. But my message to you is we have to speak about it in a way that is optimistic, that gives people a sense that it's not all lost, that in fact your action does make a difference. And that is the challenge of activism. And it doesn't mean talking about courage means that all of us now must you know, go and do something bold and, and, and sometimes somewhat crazy. Right? I mean, good activism always has a crazy element to it, by the way. <laughs> so. And positive motivation is within our grasp. So I know that I must have sounded quite pessimistic. So I want to end with two things. One is a Mahatma Gandhi quote, which he said, first, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. 
then they fight you, and then you win. So, let me say this. Global Witness, a think tank in London that looks at extractive industries, you know, mining and so on. They've just brought out a report that says every week two environmentalists get killed somewhere in the world on average. A journalist in the United States has just brought out a book called Green is the New Red. Right? I advise you to go look at it. It shows how the environmental movement is being attacked and so on. So if Gandhi was right, then it's a very optimistic place to be because they're not ignoring us, they're not laughing at us, they're fighting at us. So that, let's hope that just means that we are one step away from, from victory. I want to end with a personal story from a best friend of mine called Lenny Naidu. Yeah, same surname, no relation. Uh, we grew up in the same community. And when we were 22, we were having to flee South Africa into exile in different directions. And Lenny was the first environmentalist I knew. Uh, I didn't really understand most of what he was telling me, but now I get it. I, w I wish I was smart enough then to have got it. He uh, was also at that time probably one of like a maximum of 1,000 voluntary vegetarians on the whole African continent. Uh, and he was the heir of his time, basically. And so the last time I would see him as we would flee into exile in different directions, uh, we hugged each other and then he asked me, he said, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution we can make to the course of humanity? And I said, giving our life. And he said, you mean going, participating in the demonstration, getting shot and killed? And that was happening in South Africa all the time. You know, every weekend we were at funerals, burying people in the 80s. Right? So I said, yeah, I guess so. And he said, that's the wrong answer. He said, it's not giving your life, but giving the rest of your life. Now, I was 22 years old at the time, and as I said, my friend was way ahead of me. And he always used to say these philosophical things. <laughs> so I said, yeah, yeah. And we hugged each other, we flee in different directions, but two years later, while I was at Oxford, I get a call that my friend Lenny and eight young people from my home city, Durban, were brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. There were so many bullets in their bodies, the parents couldn't even recognize them at the mortuary. So I had to think deep and hard about the distinction that he was making between giving your life versus giving the rest of your life. Truth be said, there is not a huge amount of skill and talent involved in going and being in a demonstration at the wrong place at the wrong time and getting shot and killed. What takes real courage is to stay true to those commitments and continue to fight for as long as you have breath in your body until those injustices have been eradicated. What he was saying essentially is the struggle for justice, whether it's environmental justice, climate justice, social justice, gender justice, economic justice. These struggles are marathons, they're not sprints. And the biggest contribution we can make is having the perseverance and the stamina to stay with those struggles until victory has been achieved. And that is why I'm so honored to see one example in front of us in James Lawson, who has shown through his life that the biggest contribution we can make is not necessarily being the ones who fall early, but those of us who are around have a moral and ethical responsibility to fight as hard as we can until the injustices in the world are addressed. Because certainly for myself, and I hope for all of you, we must refuse to accept that the world that we live in today is the best that humanity can create for itself. Thank you very, very much for your attention.
Thank you very much. Very, very inspiring. And what we'd like to do now is we have time for a few questions. And um, I'm enlisting some help. Uh, so I'm actually going to ask you to call on people. I'm going to give you the mic. Yes, sir. From Cameroon. Thank you very much for that very um, inspiring um, delivery. Giving your life, giving the rest of your life. I want to take two scenarios. Cameroon, very tough environment to be active or to actively engage, you know, to, pro to push for certain rights because of fear. And when I watched the video um, talking on courage, I felt like a coward because of fear. And I am one of many who are afraid to die or afraid to be silenced. Yet, the problem you seek to push or to fight against will remain and you would pass away. I need your advice on beyond courage, what can activists do in such terrifying situations? That's one. Now, taking the case of Ghana, you showed a continuum of um, civil diso disobedience and um, whereby you go out for a protest, yet you take permission from the security officer to, in Ghana, that is how it is done. You must seek the permission of the authorities to do it. And I remember just recently, um, a group wanted to go out and march and protest against this uh, poor sanitation in, in, in Accra, and the heads of states of West African countries were to meet in Accra, and they told them that you have to move it forward to another day because of the situation at hand, and they accept. Now, in that situation, and we have burning issues, to push for, what would you advise? Should we keep on waiting and taking the permission, write the request letter, it, is it goes through the procedures and then it is granted before you go out? So what would you advise in a situation where you have a burning, dire need to push for or a request to push for and you, know, you have to go through that protocol before it is uh, permitted for you to march on? Thank you. Perhaps in the interest of time, we can collect three questions so we get more people in. Please. Um, I'm from India, and my question is more to do with um, Gandhi and his relevance today. And I wonder as a student, uh, I don't want to be an activist. I don't want to fight, but I care, and I want to do something. So where does that put me? Okay. Let's take one more and then please. India, Pakistan has to speak. Yeah, and this has been trend in the during last few days. You know, I witness uh, whenever Bhavna says something, and you know, I I feel an urge to say something. <laughs> so anyway, just uh, listening. You know, before we heard you, I was just sharing with this uh, uh, one of our colleagues from Macedonia. Mas yeah, I'm sorry, I cannot proceed. And I was just sharing that what I am in doing. She said that what you do, I, I said that we are working with young people who are exposed to all these extremism and militancy. She said, wow, that's great work. And how you are doing, and I just explained, and what is your outreach? I just said that, you know, 50,000 young people in one year. And she gets so inspired, and she said that, you know, I feel so bad because I'm doing nothing. And I said that, what you're doing? She said, research. <laughs> so after I hear you, I also have the same feeling. <laughs> and uh, what a great, I think, uh, uh, very inspirational speech and very, and just referring to my own context and, and um, the, the way I live and we live in a society, all this aspiration to, to die and to have a sacrifice, and I feel sometimes it's become irrelevant, particularly for the young people, for those who 
who are there to live a more happy and sustainable life. Everything around them intimidate them and ask them to die. So my inspiration is that how we can direct them for an activism which, team, which teach them and give them a confidence to live a dignified life and have a courage to, uh, to live. And I think that's a something that is extremely critical in today's life to live and to have the ability and courage to live with all your organic energy and creativity. So my sense is that, yes, we have to, uh, you know, direct all this uh, uh, disobedience and activism to, to, to the extreme level uh, to address the injustices, but our core has to be the, the, the essence of life. Thank you very much for those three questions. And uh, there's a commonality between the India and Pakistan question, which is a very good thing. <laughs> and, that is, and that is sort of really raising the question of what constitutes activism, actually. Uh, and what I was trying to say towards the end of my speech is that it's a real mistake to believe that the only people who are engaged in activism are the ones that are in the front line getting arrested or, or, or giving the speech or handing over the petition and so on. And, and particularly research, I can tell you that no civil disobedience activity that I've been engaged in that didn't need a good research input into figuring things out. Sometimes it's more uh, doing surveillance research of a facility and where the entrance points are and so on. <laughs> uh, but more often, before you even get to that point, it's trying to work out. Like I tell you at Greenpeace, we have a lot of people at different points in time that are spending most of the time doing research. For example, trying to figure out in the oil industry which would be the best target to go for, because we can't go after all the targets. So then one question would be, if we go for a target, would that target give us the biggest possible impact, right? And trying to figure out the intelligence behind all of that and so on is critically important. So I go back, I really want to say that I was struggling with the two messages that I was trying to give on the civil disobedience side. And let me state it again, and your, both your questions help me, as does the first question from my brother in Cameroon. We should never define activism as the end result, right? You know, what you see in the television, or who you see going to prison, or who you see coming out of prison. We have to understand everything that happens, right? So when Mr. Lawson was doing nonviolent direct action training, and in the days when none of us in the world, you know, when it, when it was being created, uh, that idea of running a training workshop to train people in how to be peaceful when you are facing uh, violence from the police, for example. Quite often, the person that's doing the training is not the person who's going to be in the front line. And just to give you a good example, the head of the Greenpeace Actions Unit, the person who oversees all our actions, right? He's brilliant, right? Totally brilliant. At our staff thing, we had a, you know, question and answers about private things about different staff and people had to guess whether it was true or false. And, and his question was, he has been arrested 30 times, true or false, right? So majority of people who didn't know him, new staff and so on, and me as well, I didn't know for sure because I've only been in Greenpeace for a couple of years. Most of us said, absolutely, it must be true. And then he got up and he said, I've never been arrested once. <laughs> and there was no shame in it, is what I'm saying. You know what I mean? And there's nothing romantic about getting arrested. I mean, any, any of you who've been inside a prison know that it's not that fun, right? So, so, so all I'm saying is that sometimes the way you get changed is by a mind-blowing report that exposes corruption like no direct action can do. So, important to recognize that in the struggle for justice, we need to have 
a menu of actions, strategies, and tactics that nobody can stand here in front of you at a global conference and tell you what is the right mix. Right? So to my brother in Cameroon, to the questions that you pose, I would say it's really important to understand that activism is fundamentally contextual. What I mean by that is what works well in one place, right, and, and, and precisely why it worked well in this place might not work well in another place. And let me give you an example. So, for example, in parts of Europe, you can get a bunch of young people, right, to go in a public space, and if you're trying to irritate a CEO of a corporation, they can all stand in a line, and they can all open the pants and pull the pants down and show the bum to the, to the CEO. And in Europe, it might work. But try doing the same thing in Egypt, or Bahrain, or Indonesia. It's not going to work, right? So, so what I'm saying is, it, you know, we should never go for a one-size-fits-all approach. However, there are certain principles that can be common. You know, not responding to violence from the state, planning well, uh, and so on. And by the way, a very big part of planning a good civil disobedience action is about ensuring that the legal defense is very well organized beforehand, right? No, no, I, I can tell you that when I was 17, I remember we were arrested in a demonstration, thrown into prison in Durban, and I was amazed at how much of money that local business people were able to raise to get the bail out. Like each of us were charged like the equivalent of $100, uh, you know, bail to get out, and we were thinking, we were like from working class backgrounds and we think, shit, our parents are never going to be able to find that money. And then within like five hours, there was a team that got the lawyers, got the bail approved, and was able to raise the money. That takes a particular skill. So, but on the issue about fear and overcoming fear, I think that the biggest threat to humanity is whether we can rise above fear. The first fear is not about giving our lives and not giving our lives. The first fear we have to raise, rise above is the fear of accepting that the world we live in is roughly the best it can be and that all is needed is a little bit of change here and there. Once we rise above being bold enough to say no, we refuse to accept that almost four, um, you know, 40% of humanity can live daily in abject poverty in one sort of the other. Once we are able to rise about saying, no, that's, that's totally unacceptable, that's the first fear we have to rise above. The second, I think, is the fear of saying, if you use action against us, we are not fundamentally going to run away. Now, it doesn't mean that we always have to follow through. But bear in mind, most governments in the world have the luxury of knowing that once they say something, people won't react. Right? And what you saw, let's say, in Tunisia, when, where the Arab resistance started, right, was people reaching a point where they said, enough is enough and no more. Right? And I think... The challenge of creative activism now is to try to harness that energy as best as we can and get people to be willing to take risks. It's not about giving your life, but, but whether people are willing to take risks. Because nothing is going to be achieved without risk taking anyway. You know, business people will tell you that, politicians will tell you that, and we should be telling ourselves that as well as people on the civil society side. But um, but if we think that activism is going to be a walk in the park, that there won't be any inconvenience and so on, I'm not saying that. But let me end by saying that one of my colleagues likes to say that the optimism of the action always can overcome the pessimism of the thought. 
Right? I'll leave that for you to think about. You know, basically, sometimes we engage in a lot of intellectual masturbation, right? Uh, and, and, you know, we talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and, in fact, it doesn't go anywhere, right? I'm not saying that dialogue is not important, but at some point, at some point, you've got to actually say that you cannot perpetually go round and round in circles, planning and replanning and not doing anything, because sometimes the optimism and the energy that we can get from taking a peaceful protest for justice can be really overpoweringly uh, inspirational to what we will do in the future. I hope I answered those questions. Okay, please. Excuse me. Oh, we're out of time. This, this will end the, the live stream portion of this session, and we want to so thank you for that, and we will have a moment for some informal Q&A afterwards, but thank you so much. It was really beautiful. So we can all relax and ask the questions we really want to ask. <laughs> Thank you so much for that really inspiring uh, talk and especially urging us to live and not just go down and lay down our lives. I think that's so important. Uh, you were talking about how context is important. You were talking about how exposing the bums might work in one place. In India, it wouldn't work because in Mumbai city, everyone is exposing their bums in the morning and crapping by the street. So that's not going to work at all. <laughs> we are so used to seeing that. Um, or 